for um, item is item 11 and the implications of the health fluoridization of drinking water fluoridation. So we have a um, presentation from Michelle. Welcome, Michelle, again. Just want to get to my slides. Yep. Good. Um, so the, this presentation is really focused on, on the response that we've given to the Ministry of Health on their specific requests concerning the cost and time frame for introducing fluoride into the Christchurch drinking water. We will provide um, some legislative context and highlight key aspects of the Amendment Act before we talk about the information request and our response to that request. The Ministry of Health website provides the motivation for the Amendment Act, um, which is really about the benefits of water fluoridation for the oral health of communities and especially children. It is important to understand where the Fluoridation Amendment Act fits in. Firstly, the Health Act established in 1956 provides the mandates and responsibilities for the Ministry of Health. Previously, drinking water was regulated as part of the Health Act, but this has now been repealed and drinking water, is, is, drinking water is legislation in terms of the Water Services Act, which together with the Water Services Regulator Act provides the mandates and responsibilities for the new Water Services Regulator, Taumata ROI. The purpose of the Fluoridation Amendment Act is to direct a local authority to add or not to add fluoride to drinking water to reduce the prevalence and severity of dental decay. This is completely separate from the drinking water regulations legislated by the Water Services Act, which has the purpose to ensure that drinking water suppliers provide safe drinking water to consumers. The Amendment Act was enacted in December 2021, and as I noted before, it allows the Director General to direct a local authority to add fluoride or not to add fluoride to its drinking water supply. A local authority must comply with this direction, and the Director General will consider both the scientific evidence as well as the benefits of adding, making sure that the benefits of adding fluoride will outweigh the cost thereof. The direction will be published and will specify the date by which a local authority must comply, as well as the level at which fluoride must be added. According to the Act, the Director General must invite comments from local authorities about the estimated financial cost for adding fluoride, as well as the date by which a local authority will be able to comply with the direction. This is essentially what was asked in a letter to the mayor and chief executive dated 15th of December, and we were given up to the 11th of March to respond to the information request. Once a local authority receives a direction or is invited to comment, as was done on the 15th of December, that local authority is not required to consult on the matter. Lastly, there are several sections in the Act which outlines what will happen if a local authority does not comply with the direction given by the Director General. As referenced in the previous slide, the Director General asked Christchurch for comments on the 15th of December, but there are some key messages in this letter that should be highlighted at this point. First of all, it was noted that directions will be given from mid 2022 onwards, but also that a stage approach may be adopted to align with the water reform process. All local authorities were encouraged to start with fluoridation related preparatory work, and we need not wait to be directed before starting to add fluoride to our drinking water. It was noted that limited funds are available for those that can start fluoridation before the end of 2022, but also that more information would be provided about this at a later stage. The Director General did recognize or does recognize that fluoridation will be complex for some. We believe he meant us. And then lastly, fluoride need only be added to community water supplies servicing more than 500 people. So for us, this would mean the Christchurch City as well as Brooklyn's Kainga water supply and Akarua. 
The information request was sent to 56 local authorities, those that do not currently add fluoride to their drinking water, um, and comprising about 224 community drinking water supplies. Um, as indicated on the attached map, um, those, the white areas that uh, do not currently um, add fluoride. It is noted, was, it is noted by um, actually the Massey University website that 61% of New Zealanders on drinking, on registered drinking water supplies have access to fluoridated drinking water and that people in the North Island are four times more likely to have access than people in, in the South Island. Our response to the Ministry of Health was aligned with the specific questions asked in the letter. Firstly, to confirm that Christchurch does not currently add fluoride to its drinking water, nor do we have any projects underway to add fluoride. The estimated capital cost to add fluoride at 50 location, locations is in excess of 60 million. And this estimate includes a 30% contingency and a 12% escalation allowance. The long-term plan does not provide for fluoridation at present. We believe that once funding is in place, it will take at least three and a half years to complete the implementation of fluoridation. We have however, advised the ministry that a delay of two to four years should be considered to allow us to complete our water safety projects and because we cannot work at our pump stations simultaneously. The operating cost impact is expected as more than, at more than two and a half million being 1.8 million for chemicals, resources, maintenance, and then other 1.1 million for um, depreciation. We have been asked to provide more information on why fluoridation would be so much more expensive for Christchurch. Firstly, the configuration of our water supply system is very different from other cities, where generally you would have one or more raw water sources feed, feeding into a single water treatment plant or several water treatment plants. An example of this is, uh, is Akarua, where we have up to six raw water sources feeding into one water treatment plant um, from where it is then distributed into the network. So in Christchurch, we abstract water direct from the confined aquifers into the network, and we therefore need not to treat the water. Fluoride is normally added as part of the water treatment process. Because our pump stations are not treatment plants, also our command and control systems have not been equipped to monitor and control treatment processes. We would therefore have to provide additional instrumentation and communication equipment to manage the fluoridation process. Also, our pump stations supply water at variable flow rates, depending on the demand at any given time. This means that we must continuously match the amount of fluoride dosed into the system with the flow rate out of the pump stations. Conventional treatment plants normally produce water at, at a more stable rate. Fluoride is added to water in a liquid state through a dosing pump. Because our pump stations are so close to the network, we must introduce additional mixing equipment into the pipes to make sure that the fluoride is adequately mixed before it reaches the first customer. We have to also introduce safety precautions to make sure that the fluoride, that, that the allowed fluoride dosing rate is not exceeded. And this includes, this will include special fluoride concentration analyzers downstream of the dosing point. Lastly, the fluoride tanks and equipment must be protected from the environment. It must be kept in a sterile state and must comply with health and safety provisions. This means that the fluoride equipment must be housed in a separate room or building equipped with an air scrubber. We are continuing to investigate the use of different forms of fluoride that could reduce the health and safety requirements, whilst also ensuring that our operators are kept safe when adding fluorides to the storage tanks and when otherwise handling the equipment. The projected implementation period of three and a half years is because we cannot take our pump stations out of operation during the summer peak period, peak demand period. Also, to deliver the demand outside of summer, we need enough pump stations to operate, so we cannot work on all the pump stations simultaneously. 
The reason we have said that we needed a two to four year delay is because we are busy implementing the reservoir and section tank repair program. We envisage that this work pro program will take at least another four years to complete. And this work also requires pump stations to be taken offline, ex ex specifically when we work on, on section tanks. Or it will necessitate a pump station to be operating full time when we need to take a reservoir offline. This will again mean that we cannot work on these pump stations simultaneously to install fluoridation equipment. There's also the matter of not having enough contractors to undertake all the physical work at once. We are continuing with phase two of the concept plans, planning stage where we will do preliminary designs at five specific locations to help us better refine the cost estimate. We expect to get feedback from the Ministry of Health in May 2022. Should we be directed to start fluoridation, we will have to include funding in the next long-term plan or depending on the direction, um, we may have to include this in an annual plan change. This will be needed whether or not we receive additional funds from government. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle. Your reports are so detailed and clear and easy to follow. They're really lovely. Um, so can I have the screen shifted now so I can see everybody? That's shortly. And then I will open it up for questions. And I'm um, just reminded too that the, you know, we have not been directed to do so yet. Um, and we have, um, so we're receiving the recommendations to receive this report, but we have um, cobbled together another couple of resolutions that we'll put up on the screen shortly. So we have questions, Yani. Thanks. Um, th and thanks for the um, presentation. Um, obviously, it's pretty concerning that they don't know much about our water given how much um, time when money we've spent on um, the water safety plan. But I just wanted to check in terms of the consultation. I appreciate that we don't have to consult, but are we able to? What's, I didn't quite get that, um, the implications of that. Like, could we consult our community over the decision? I don't know if that's a question for Michelle, really, but I think what you'd be talking about would be engagement because the consultation is fruitless since we are being directed to do this. But we can get we can get strong comms out about it, and we have started to no, do no, it already. It was the consultation, like in the presentation. There's a slide that says councils do not have to consult. It's, it's included in the amendment act. It actually does say that local authorities need not consult. Um, again, because it's legislated, it's not up to councils to decide. Oh, sorry. Let me just put it a different way. I know it says that we don't, we do not need to consult, but if we chose to consult, given the massive ramifications this will have on our community, both from a financial point of view and and also the issue with um, the actual decision, uh, could we consult? Of, point we of order, consult? Madam Chair. Point of yeah. order. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm always reluctant to raise a point of order because um, you, you, you kind of want a free flow, but um, it needs to be very explicit about what the um, member is asking that we consult on, because th there is no decision for the council in relation to the decision to fluoridate. The question yeah. around reallocating capital expenditure, we've already heard that that has to go either into an annual plan or a long-term plan change. And that will have to be consulted on. So I wasn't quite clear about what he was mentioning. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. I was just trying to bring the PowerPoint um, back up, but there was that slide in the PowerPoint that says- we uh, I know not. what, sorry, I know what you're saying. Are you talking about, and through the chair, is he talking about consulting on the decision to fluoridate, which hasn't been made yet, we haven't received a direction, as you said right at the outset, or is the is he talking about the decision to put more money on our capital budget if we are, because we've already been told we have to do that through an annual planning process, which is a requirement to re consult. So I, I, I'm not clear. What oh, I don't know. That's why I was trying to ask staff around the consultation, because 
when we get that phrase, uh, that's why I was trying to ask staff what that actually means in terms okay, of- Okay, Yanni, look, we've got Ian Thompson here, he can step up, but I will say to you that really, I think there would be no appetite to consult because there's no point in it, but engagement is a different thing, we can engage. But Ian, if you're here, would you like to make a brief comment for Yanni? Yes, um, essentially, if the council resolved to consult, it could, but you'd have to weigh that against um, the circumstances that you're faced with here, um, whether or not there is any benefit in consulting. Um, the Mayor has pointed out that we'll have to consult if we're um, adding considerable sums to our um, capital program through the mm. LTP or the annual plan. Um, I think it's too early to make any kind of conclusions as to whether or not we should or could consult. Um, we'll need to look at that. Um, in light of what the um, Ministry of Health um, tell us that we have what we have to do. Thank you. Right, um, Sam. Yeah, Mom's put on the same thing as Leanne's. Oh, engine. Sam, you're a Dalek. I'll just back up. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you to come back. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, oh, hang on. Sorry. Yeah. Thank. Th thanks, Pauline. Okay. Um. Yep. Have we given any thought, and, and I, this is a fantastic report, and it, it, it's great because I can understand how the difficulties of um, putting fluoride into the, the many different water supply wells that we've got around town, and I can totally understand it. If we looked at the, the bigger picture, because um, you being elderly like myself, Pauline, will remember when your mother... Thank you, Phil. <laughs> when your mother gave you the, the fluoride tabs way, way back in the day, if... We're looking at it $63 million to, to implement it, and then the operating cost of 1.8 plus the renewal cost over 20 years is 1.1 a year. We're looking 63 to implement it, and then nearly three a year to, um, to operate it. Would we better be better to actually, as a city, buy fluoride tabs and give them to schools for every kid? Because it's got to be cheaper than doing this, because it's only when you're young that you need the fluoride tabs, once you get to, I don't know, I'm not an expert, I'll say 12, 14, you don't need them, but I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, well, I think that that's what I'm trying to address in the resolution. We've asked the, um, the um, Crown to advise us what alternatives they've looked at, particularly for Christchurch, because we are a little bit unusual with our water supply being under pressure and having so many pump stations and equaling such a massive cost. So, um, you know, um, I hope that they can give us a list of all the um, options that they've looked at and if we can actually get a meeting with the um, Director General of Health um, to actually point out the differences in Christchurch, that's also in the resolution that we'll bring up in a minute. Um, so Leanne and then Jimmy. So I think that it might be helpful if staff explained in detail the, the steps that the legislation now requires. So the reason that, and this is my understanding from reading the paper, the reason that the um, Director General has, as uh, he is entitled under the Act, to require information on both the costs of implementation and the timing of implementation is so that he can weigh up the costs and timing um, against the benefits of fluoridation. And, and once he's done that, then he makes the call. Now, as I understand it, there, there is no, no statement in the Act as to who pays. Um, it doesn't say that uh, the council has to, but it doesn't say that the Ministry of Health has to. So I think, I think it's really important that councillors understand, and so I'm actually testing whether I've understood it, that there's a sequence of events that we have to go through first that um, the, the Director General of Health has to consider, has to weigh up the scientific e evidence around fluoridation and the, and, um, the question around um, you know, tooth decay, et cetera. And then the second question is a cost-benefit analysis, analysis, which is why he's asked all of the councils that don't fluoridate how much it would cost and how long it would take and any of the particular challenges that we have. 
And I presume that that's an iterative process. You're going to be in conversations with the Ministry of Health before the Director General comes to the point of making a call on that. And in the meantime, we want to have a very clear understanding of, of who would pay and, and whether they will be looking at the options. So I think they're the sort of kind of, if we can have it just a, a step through the process. Thanks, Leanne. Who would like to take that on for comment, just to um, confirm Leanne's on the right track there? Is that you, Michelle? I think the evidence support, but yes, I think that is how, how I read the Act and how I understand it. At this stage, we're providing comments and we're providing the, the Director General with the costs and the implementation period. And um, we, we do need to have the Director General and his office coming back to us and have those discussions regarding what next. Does that satisfy you, Leanne? Well, I think that um, there, there, there does seem to be a bit of misunderstanding um, in just some of the questions that have already been asked about you know, the, the, the different layers of the process that we're in. And so at, at some point, we're going to want to have some influence over um, who pays if the, if the Director General is going to direct that this happen, because this is this would be the most substantial unfunded mandate ever. So that's that's what I, that's why I want to um, get an explicit piece of advice on the, the the sequencing of what we do when. Okay, don't. So shall we take that as an action from this meeting? and request that in a memo. Right, I think we will. So have you got that, Andrew? Andrew Campbell noted that? Yep. Thank you. Right, Sam's back, and then we've got Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. And it, it probably aligns with what Leanne was saying, so it may be um, something to be picked up later. I'm just trying to understand, and it might be a question for Ian, potentially. So. You know, I completely get that there's restrictions on consultation over uh, the directive from central government. I guess what I'm trying to understand is if we consulted in the long-term plan to reprioritise uh, and the community came back overwhelmingly saying, actually, no, we want you to focus on the safe water as opposed to the fluoridisation, uh, what would happen? I mean, you know, we would have to take their views into account, but from a legal point of view, I imagine we'd still have to proceed with the fluoride, wouldn't we? Well, that's entirely um, dependent on what the Director General directs us to do and whether or not the Crown is going to contribute to the cost. Um, I really am not in a position to give you too much detail on that because I don't know enough about the subject, but I'm happy to come back to you with um, more detailed advice, if you'd like. It would just be good to understand, you know, if we are saying that we would consult, if we have to around budget changes, whether that consult, uh, consultation is actually relevant or not, because if it's a government directive, as Leanne said, an unfunded mandate, we may be sort of, I, I'd hate to be at the risk of sort of misleading the public or setting false expectations when actually we can't change it. So look, even if it's something you can take offline and, and maybe it'll be worked through over the coming months, but yeah, I, I would just hate to think that people think we could consult through the LTP if in fact we actually can't change that government directive and how we and our prioritisation of funding. Yeah, it, so, sounds, it sounds awfully like, f familiar, like um, Three Waters reform, doesn't it? it? Well, yeah, there's about five sort of central government takeovers at the moment, but you, you did yeah. right. Yeah. I'm happy to come back with Jim. some more detailed advice around that. Jimmy. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. And then Tim. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the cost, uh, um, because here uh, total is $63 million, which consists of two parts, 44 operational pump station, 58, plus five the new pump station, five million. Hey, but I'm not sure, you, you also mentioned 30% uh, contingency allowance and 12% escalation. Whether the $63 million is cover these two items or not? Is another additional exclude or include? That's all inclusive. Um, all include. Okay, let, yes. that's good. The other one is uh, why the five new 
pump station five million, so each new one is only one million. But the uh, operation existing pump station, each one is 1.3. So I, I, I get lost. Why should be new ones more expensive? Why is it cheaper? I have no idea. When we, okay. um, sorry for confusing. Um, when we build new pump stations, though, we are able to build it to include already that extra room or that extra space that's needed. So it will effectively end up in being less costly for new pump stations. So if we haven't costed to put in fluoridation into the pump stations that we are going to replace or are going to build new, um, there will be some cost efficiency in that by just designing those pump stations to already include um, fluoridation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Tim? Thank you. I guess it's uh, um, going back to Ian, the, the 61 or, or 63 or 65 million or whatever that it, it's um, estimated at, plus the ongoing costs of around 2 million, um, the operational costs. Is that something that we would have to consult on through a long-term plan because of the adjustments with regards to the budgets? I mean, Sam mentioned about one or the other with regards to the safety of water or adding fluoride, which would be the priority. But I, it's actually, I don't think it's that question. I think it's adjusting our um, budget. So what would be the thought there if the government didn't come in and um, support us. Yes, of course, that would be included in the capital program for an LTP, and that would be out for consultation. But um, as to the effectiveness of that, given any directions from the Crown, um, you'd have to wonder. Um, but certainly, you, you would want to include that in your capital program with the LTP, or if it was an annual plan year and required in the annual plan year, it would be a significant departure from the um, LTP and you would have to consult on that. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ian. Okay, I can't see any more questions. So um, it'd be good to get the uh, recommendations up. And I, Leanne, I'd like to invite you to comment on those because um, I don't think you've seen them till just recently. So, um, We've put in the number one remains the same. Number two is notes council is investing in a drinking water improvement program and has significant funds on budget in the LTP, but has no funds budgeted for fluoridation, fluoridation capital or operational costs. Notes fluoridation is a national health issue, and therefore we are directed to if we are directed to fluoridate our drinking water supply, agrees the crown should fund all costs. Instructs the number four instructs the chief executive to write to the director general of health requesting that before any decision is taken to instruct this council to fluoridate its water supply, request council sees all the alternative options considered to fluoridate the children's teeth. Five, the mayor invites the director general of health to meet and discuss the Christchurch situation. So I'd like to, um, Leanne, are you happy with those recommendations? Well, the, 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 the last one just, and I mean, I, I know that um, uh, I think Sam pointed out uh, by way of an email that um, that the Director General's just resigned. So that's why the reference to his individual name has um, has changed. So um, the, the, only, the only thing is, is, the, is the timing of that. So as, as long as people are reasonably comfortable with just leaving this until we have some additional advice, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy for the resolution and I'll, I'll support all of the resolutions there. Um, but I think that it might be useful just to um, be aware that this is not an immediate directive to me to invite the Director of General of Health because there is, um, just to use a phrase, uh, a lot of water to go under the bridge yet before um, he will indicate uh, whether we will receive the direction. And the direction, as I say, is not something that is negotiable. As we've heard, there, is a, there are consequences um, uh, for failure to comply. Um, but of course, uh, he has indicated publicly that, that directions won't be made till the middle of the year. He has also indicated that um, uh, staging, as we've read in the paper, that staging of um, any directions um, is possible. Uh, and uh, we've heard 
that in order for us to meet our community's priorities in terms of safe drinking water that is good to drink, um, then we require at least, um, well, it looks closer to 24 months to me before you'd even start the process of um, looking at the, 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 the capital program. So, um, which would take us into another LTP period. Um, and, 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 and if the, if the Crown came to the party accepting that this is a huge unfunded mandate to put on um, uh, drinking water users uh, for, the, for, the, for a health benefit that would otherwise be directed to the health system uh, for funding. So, you know, you see what I mean? Like, there, there are just a few issues that need to be worked through. Um, and, and so I, I'm happy to support it as it stands, as long as no council is going to ask me next month why I haven't um, written to the Director General of Health to ask to meet with um, him or her, whoever the next one is, um, before then. Well, look, thanks, Leanne, and I'm happy to move these recommendations. And as the mover, I'm happy to leave that timing in your hands because you're the best person to make a call on when that timing's right. Um, well, so I'm, happy, I'm happy to second it on that basis, and I'm happy that um, I'm happy that uh, I will keep in, informing staff, so uh, councillors. I'll keep keep councillors up to date with where I'm at. But I think that we need some some advice from uh, within the council and possibly some external advice as well in order to support our decision making going forward, what little there is uh, under the circumstances, because I think this is going to require a substantial advocacy component as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think that we've got those actions noted in today's discussion. All right, so thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? And I can't see the screen. Is there any debate? Can we? Uh, no. I'm right. happy to start. I'm happy to, because I mean, I would like to say a couple of things. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I was just struggling to find my hand again. <laughs> it's all right. um, I think that uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, thank you, a huge thank you to staff for going to all of this trouble to provide such a um, significant and, and, and transparent briefing uh, so that the public can see the sequence mm -hmm. of events events that have occurred in relation to the passing of legislation, legislation that was passed by Parliament late last year. When I say Parliament, I know it's very quick for people to go, this is government. Every single political party in Parliament supported this. There was no division called. Um, I was going to quote from speeches from all sides of the House uh, supporting uh, the underpinning of this legislation. But what very, there was no turning of their minds to the funding of it, because I think there's been an assumption made that the water services um, provider, and in that instance, it's us as the council, the water services provider will have one treatment plant, they'll be able to dose it up with um, fluoride, as many of the um, the uh, ones that currently fluoridate their water supplies and, um, and distribute it from one treatment plant. That is not the case in Christchurch, and that's why we've ended up with what is an eye-watering um, cost of $63 million. And that is a trebling of the last time that this was assessed in 2017 um, by, by City Care. Um, and and we, we, we had a rough assessment then. This report that we've now provided to the um, Ministry of Health um, contains a lot more detail. And I just think staff have done an extraordinary job with everything else that's going on with all the three waters reforms and all of the information that have been asked for from our staff in the same section. They have provided a detailed assessment that takes into account a much wider range of issues. And we've heard that the biggest component of the cost comes from the fact that we would have to provide individual treatment capacity at nearly 50 pressure pump statements, unlike other councils who take water from a single source and then um, treat it in a single plant before distributing it um, to households. And that's what we do in Akaroa. 
So, um, you know, we know that experience, but it isn't our experience for the Christchurch Littleton uh, water supply. Um, the, the Director General has a legal obligation to weigh up the costs with the benefits, and these costs are huge. And he, he will or she will have to weigh this up against the alternative ways of distributing fluoride um, to those who are in need. And, um, and Phil Major raised the fact, well, I'm older, obviously, in that category, because I remember having fluoride tablets every single day as a child. And I remember um, knowing that all of my schoolmates got, um, <laughs> got uh, uh, you know, at the murder house, at the, at the dental, dental um, clinic that we went to, um, they all got fillings. I didn't have a single filling when I left school. And, and that's the, the, the huge challenge that government has taken on. It's a health issue. The decisions made by a health official, these are health benefits, and that's where the funding should come from. That's just, it's, it's not about water safety, and that's what we're on about. Our priority remains the delivery of demonstrably safe drinking water. And for us, that's also good to drink, um, hence our work towards gaining an exemption from chlorination. And I think that's where our drinking water funding is required under our long-term plan to be spent. That remains our priority. And what we need to do is advocate very strongly um, to central government that they have to pay the costs from the health budget, not from our council's ratepayers. Thank you, Ian. That's brilliant. Yanni. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a few comments to add to the debate. Uh, one, you know, it just to me shows how completely out of touch the Ministry of Health is in terms of Christchurch and what we've been through over the last decade. The fact that we've had earthquakes, the fact that we've had the terror attacks, the fact that we've had floods, fires, we've had the pandemic. And yet they still continue to put our city under enormous pressure um, around our water infrastructure, both with the forced chlorination and now potentially the forced uh, fluoridation. And it's just baffling to me that despite all the work that we've done uh, around the um, drinking water and the water safety plans, that they're still asking basic questions about our water infrastructure in regards to fluoride um, adding fluoride like it just shows you I think that they are completely oblivious to the, the reality of what we've been through as a city for the past decade and completely oblivious to the state of our infrastructure that we have to spend so much time and resource answering their questions when this is exactly the sort of stuff that should have been thought about um, ahead of whatever has been uh, proposed to go through parliament and certainly um, in terms of uh, any decisions being made where we are um, going to have to face the consequences as a city. So I, I totally support the recommendations that have been put forward. Um, it, it is unbelievable that we're in this situation and hopefully we can get a face-to-face -face meeting with the DG to explain the frustration of what we've been put through by the Ministry of Health. All right, if no one else has got anything to say, look, I totally support your comments, Yanni, and of course, Leanne's put it very succinctly and um, in a detailed way as well. Imagine if we passed what is the equivalent of a bill without looking at the financial implications. Um, we obviously do things very differently in our council, but we have gone through a heck of a lot throughout the last 10 years in, in, or 12 years um, at the council, and particularly since uh, 2013, I feel for Leanne as our leader, what she has carried us through. It's incredible what we have sustained as a city. And every single event, like the, the earthquakes, the fires, the floods, the, um, the pandemic, the, the um, mosque attacks, they've been had huge, not just personal costs, but financial implications on this council. And we've carried that load all the time, keeping our rates rises at I, what I believe is a very sustainable level. And I just think I'd like to re recognise Leanne's efforts there as leading us through that. It is absolutely massive what you've carried us through. And I just want to say that at this stage. And to have this being imposed on, on us with this massive cost, this gobsmackingly eye-watering cost, all I can um, say is I really hope the Director General treats us differently. We are different. 
very different in our water supply and actually looks at that cost and perhaps looks very closely at other alternatives. And I'll be very interested in that response to see what other alternatives they have actually entertained. We are obliged to put up options when we put anything out, a new project or anything out for a proposal. Um, we don't see any options in here and I would like to see some options. So that's all I'll have to say on that matter. And uh, I support the recommendation and on that note, I'll put the recommendation. So please wave if you support it. And any opposed? No. Okay, all those in favour say aye, we have. I'll pass that recommendation. And I'll now invite Councillor um, Templeton to close with a karakia, please. Sorry, just finding my new button there. Uh, Unuhia te pau, te pau whiri marama, tomokia te ao te ao whatatangata. Tātai ki runga, tātai ki raro, tātai aho rau, homi e, hui e, tai ki e. Kia ora, thank you Sarah, and thank you everyone, that was a really good and really interesting meeting I thought, personally. Um, look, um, we